join me in reading this morning's responsive call to worship from Psalm 66. Shout joyful praises to God, all the earth. Sing about the glory of God's name. Tell the world how glorious is God. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shouting your name in glorious songs. Come and see what our God has done, what awesome miracles he performs for people. Let the whole world bless God and loudly sing God's praises. And our gathering prayer continues in parts. Everywhere we find you, O God, in every face, small or large, in every hand, young or old, in every word, loud or soft, in every thought, deep or shallow, say our names, O God, hold us close, shape our living and make us yours. Amen. children's message this morning. I didn't have to really remember to bring anything special with me outside of the Bible, which I always bring with me in case I, there's a sudden glitch with the lector and, and we need a Bible up here with the lessons read. So Bible, um, we have in scripture this morning in our gospel, continuing in John's gospel, chapter 14, the words, Jesus said to his disciples on Maundy Thursday, this is before Easter during Holy Week, he's trying to teach them about what life will be like when he's not physically present. And he said, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. So, question this morning for each of you, and I know the answer for many, is how many of you have a pet? Yeah? I know, I know, me too, I have two dogs. But back in the day, in my youth, I owned a pet parakeet named Merlin, and Merlin uh, was my best friend. I spent hours playing and talking and being with Merlin, and when I would come home, from wherever I was, uh, any time I was in the house, the apartment, the cage doors were open so Merlin could follow me around the house. And he would sit on my shoulder, and if I was reading or working, he would just chatter nicely in my ear. That was Merlin. Um, I loved Merlin. He was my best friend at that time. And one of the most important ways I showed my love was by spending time with him because parakeets as people are social animals and also by other things like making sure he had food and his cage was clean and and he had fresh water so Merlin knew that I loved him so if I came over to your house today and I watched you and your pet or pets together how would I know that you loved them What kind of things do you do to show your love for the animals, I might say the people too, that you live with? Um, It's important to remember that it's not enough just to say, I love my pet. Um, Loving isn't something you just say to an animal in your care. It's something you show by the things you do to care for it just as it cares for you. So I want to throw out another question, and it's a big one. Do you love Jesus? Does Jesus know that you love him? What do you do or what can you do to show Jesus that you love him? It's a question that's hard to answer maybe in day-to-day life. Um, But in today's gospel, Jesus gives his disciples the answer to that question. And I just said it at the very beginning. If you love me, then you will follow my commandments, do what you're supposed to do in the world to um, 
take care of one another, to pay attention to God, what is holy in your life, and to love your friends and your neighbors just the same way you love yourself. So some of the other things he says is to worship God, to tell others about Jesus, to talk to him daily in prayer. We have that in Matthew's Gospel. To read his word, that's why I remembered the Bible this morning, pay attention to what God says through scripture, and importantly, to forgive others as God forgives us. Things we can do to show Jesus that we love him, and in doing those things, we show the world how loving God is through us. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we are quick to say that we love you, but we know that we need to show our love as well. Help us to show our love for you just as you show your love for us. It is in Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Our next hymn is an insert, Sing a New Church, verses 1, 3, and 5. Confident of God's willingness and readiness to forgive us, let us join our voices together in the prayer of confession printed in our bulletins. Forgiving one, unseen yet known, we hear the world speak in power and in greed, and we hear you speak in love and grace. May our lives be lived in the echo of your voice. When we are persuaded by wants that lead to hurt, to greed, or to selfishness, forgive us for following the wrong way, and may we turn again and follow you. When we are persuaded by the spin that becomes truth, the belief that becomes dogma, the fear that becomes intolerance, forgive us for following the wrong way, and may we turn again and follow you. Forgiving one, seeing and forgiving, knowing and loving, we turn from following the wrong way and face you with our confessions. Hear us. 
Our confessions continue in the silence of our hearts. Lord, you know our truth, and we count on you to forgive us. Amen. Hear these words of assurance of God's forgiveness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the good news of the gospel. And hear these words of assurance of the law from the law of God. Again, John's gospel. Chapter 13, Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the good news of the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ in community. Let us stand and join our voices together in singing to the glory of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inspired word which shows us the way. May the hearing of your holy word this morning be that lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. From the book of Acts, Paul speaking at Athens. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives life, gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far away from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, 
an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And from John's Gospel, the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will send you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you often. I am coming to you. In a little while, while the world no longer will see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Well, whew, we have Paul and we have Jesus. We have two iconic passages this morning, and it's Mother's Day. What to do? Uh, dedication to worshiping the right God, right God in the right way, has wreaked havoc and terror and destruction among people probably since forever. Uh, all of human history would be my best guess. Paul visits Athens on his second missionary trip and he spends some time getting a sense of the town itself. It's clear he's traveled around and looked and assessed it. He checks in with the diaspora Jews, those who are in exile from, from Israel in the local synagogue first, and he gets a reputation around town for preaching some pretty oddball religious stuff that gets him an invitation to speak with the Areopagus. That's the group, the area in the marketplace where religious and philosophical debate goes on by the kind of learned folk. Four centuries have passed since Socrates stood in that place with his debates, the Socratic method of teaching, etc. Um, Twenty centuries have passed from Paul's time until now. And human beings, frankly, are still engaging in that same dialogue, oftentimes in violent ways. Is there a God is the question, big one, in theological circles since the 70s, that iconic book that uh, is titled God, The Death of God, and all the ones that followed God is Dead, and the Vietnam War, and post-World War I and World War II, questions, questions. Um, well, and if there is a God, which one is the correct God? Worldwide communication is ramped up, and everybody seems to think we have the inside track on the right God. Well, how are we supposed to honor this God that we think is the right one? And if Paul were to walk into any of our cities or towns, what would he identify as the objects of our worship today? If he were to visit our homes, what would he see about our own values? I remember a church stewardship session 
oh, many, many years ago. Um, Don Trost ran it, and he said, if you look at your checkbooks, you can see what it is you value most by the numbers in the paid section. Well, Paul was smart and educated and passionate, that man. He includes a quote from the Greek poet Epimenides in that passage that we just heard, four centuries old uh, poet, uh, uh, I'm sorry, six centuries old. He was a semi-mythical, we don't really know much about Epimenides. Um, he was a philosopher who is said to have, and this is a familiar story having grown up in the Hudson Valley, who is said to have fallen asleep for 57 years in a Cretan cave sacred to Zeus, after which he reportedly awoke with the gift of prophecy and poetry. And he wrote, in him we live and move and have our being. He's talking about a poem that's about Zeus. They fashioned a tomb for thee, O high and holy one, the Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. But thou art not dead, thou livest and abidest forever, for in thee we live and move and have our being the lie or the false belief of the Cretans that he was writing for was that Zeus was mortal. Epimenides considered Zeus to be immortal. So there's a thread in a divinity, a saving grace that's larger than our life that goes easily in recorded history six centuries before Paul. So, at first, Paul is trying to woo those uh, educated Greeks in that marketplace by showing that he too was a man of letters. Um, that was okay for starters, but he had to go further or was there was just no point in his being there at all. He had to make his testimony to the fact of the risen Christ in order to make a point of the personality, the reality, the presence of the one living true God in the world. Um, so how we do that, how we do that, defines our God to the rest of the world. How we live our life tells a story of the God we profess to follow. And that's our challenge today as individuals, I think, always in our culture, but also as a community of faith, again, in this culture. Um, Bishop John Shelby Spong, a late wonderful theologian from the Episcopal tradition, observed in his lecture, God in the 21st century. He wrote, you cannot define God. You can only experience God. And we have been trying methodically through centuries of religious thought to define God so that everyone understands the right way. Uh, the God that Jesus experienced and proclaimed is the same God that we profess to experience personally through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. But there's so much more to it than that for each one of us in our own lives. Uh, Fred Beekner, a, a Lutheran minister, observed, we experience God in three ways, as something beyond, as something among, and as something within. The wonderful womanist author and philosopher Alice Walker wrote in her book, The Color Purple, again, another iconic book in the 70s. Um, she wrote, have you ever found God in church? I never did. I just found a bunch of folks hoping for him to show. Any God ever felt in church, I brought in with me. And I think other folks did that too. They come to church to share God, not find God. What a philosophy shifting notion that everyone is in relation with God in all of our lifetimes and that we come together as church 
to share what we know and experience among each other of God ourselves. Cosmic concept in religious circles. Jesus lived and died and lives again to share God to people. He promised us in the passage we just heard, the paraclete, that very presence of the pneuma of God, the paraclete translates kind of as advocate or uh, mediator, and pneuma is, of course, the spirit or the breath or the uh, inspirational component of God. So our advocate, our inspiration, our counselor, our guide, Jesus promised who would be with us, each one of us in the world always. And of course, there's a but, <laughs> but. The spirit counselor doesn't make decisions for you. The spirit counselor encourages and exhorts and sustains and supports and in a Mother's Day way, I'm thinking like a midwife. In my experience, in two births with a midwife, her main job was to encourage, you're doing great. Keep, keep doing it that way. Try doing this for a while. Okay, breathe, relax your shoulders, try this. How do you feel? Do you need a sip of water? What can I do for you? That sounds like the Holy Spirit around us, or this paraclete of Jesus to me, like our very own spiritual midwife available to every one of us in the birth of our Lord Jesus in a relationship with the eternal God that's all-encompassing. So what is this spiritual midwife of? Um, Spiritual director and author Alan Jones wrote, spirituality is for the hatching of the heart. I love that. So hatching of the heart, how does an egg hatch? I wish we had our farmer and our egg lady here this morning to kind of clarify how an egg hatches. How many of you have experienced or seen chickens hatching, birds hatching? Yeah, sometimes they do it in elementary school. And the thing is, you can't help. You ought not to interfere with that process. Um, an egg hatches from the work of the little chick inside. It's got a special little thing on its beak that cracks open the shell. And occasionally, when it's pretty much done, mom will come and, and move the shell out of the way a little bit. But if you do it yourself, if you interfere with that process, if you say, little chick, you're doing this the wrong way, let me help, then you do damage to that experience. Um, the chick won't thrive in the same way. Um, so that process is important. It's important to be present. It's amazing to witness. But it's also a very personal process. Um, Celtic Christians chose a wild goose, for example, as a symbol representing the Holy Spirit among us, that present helper that gives us uh, space and encouragement but doesn't necessarily interfere. A, a wild goose, if you've ever known them, or Canada geese are everywhere it seems these days, they're really bothersome and they're really noisy. You can always tell when the geese are uh, migrating because not only are they flying above head, but they're calling to one another. They're noisy critters. And I love that image because it jars us out of our complacency. The Holy Spirit is not just sitting back as God watches or as Jesus kind of, uh, I've done my bit, now it's up to you. No. it harasses us, it makes noise around us, it lets us know it's there, but we have to pay attention. Um, it's manifested in different ways in this world today. And again, on Mother's Day, I, I have came across a story I wanted to share because it resonates. Um, story about a mother dying and a child uh, bedside who says, Mom, do you remember how often you told me about the time when I was just a kid and I'd be playing out in the backyard, 
And every once in a while, I'd run into the house, and I would leap up into your arms and get a quick hug, and then run right back out again to play. She held my hand a little tighter. She remembered. Mom, you had strong arms. And even though I'd take a flying leap at you, you'd always catch me and give me a hug. She smiled. I couldn't catch you in my arms anymore, dear child. I know, Mom, but I still come running in for a hug. Only now you catch me with your heart. Traditionalists worry that technology has taken young believers away from the practice of religion without committing to a church home. And I think they're probably right. When Bible study can be done on Facebook as easily as in the church hall, and a favorite teacher can preach lessons on a podcast or uh, the the necessity of, of physically gathering each week in the same place with the same people uh, has turned remote. Um, it's a new crisis for organized religion that was thoroughly exacerbated during COVID. We no longer get that child running for the hug when they can just sit at home and click through. Talking about Jesus, talking about spirituality is not the same as living responsibly as a member of a faith community, as a Christian, accountable not only to your own concept of God, but to other people as well. And that's the hard part, the church family who not only accept and love you as you are, but also with whom you can work in community, with whom through those intimate and close-knit interactions on a regular basis, you learn how to be a better human being, a better Christian, and closer to the God who is with all of us always. Part of the Easter mystery, the seasonal mystery, is that we don't always recognize in the present what is already here, for whatever reason. Uh, we learn that those near and dearest to Jesus himself didn't recognize him at the tomb in the garden, on the way to Emmaus in the upper room. Uh, unless I touch your wounds, I'm not going to believe it's you. The importance of spiritual discipline to practice seeing the presence of God in our lives cannot be overstated. It is important to gather together and to share and to grow. Uh, quick example, Helen Keller, many of us know the story of her. She's still an iconic story, I hope, taught in elementary schools, born uh, perfectly well, but very early on, I forget if it was diphtheria, um, caused her to become deaf and blind as a young child. Um, she couldn't see and she couldn't hear. And because Helen was blind and deaf, it was difficult for her to learn how to talk or read or to write. And her teacher, Annie Sullivan, helped her connect things and ideas with letters that she would spell in Helen's hand. We all have seen, I hope, that movie. If you haven't, look it up and watch it. Slowly, Helen learned that the pattern of fingers meant certain words. Those symbols took meaning and soon she was reading and writing and speaking in her own way. And one day, Ann Sullivan spelled G-O-D into Helen's hand, and Helen got very excited. She signaled back, I always knew who he was, and now I know God's name. God is a living force for goodness and holiness in life. We learned, many of us as children in Sunday school, that God is love. But Anne Morrow Lindbergh said, love is not a result, it is a cause. People talk about love as though it were something you could give, like an armful of flowers on Mother's Day. Love is a force in you that enables you to give other things. It's a power, like money or steam or electricity. 
it is valueless unless you can give something else by means of it. So given what you know of Jesus Christ, I wonder what statements of affirmation would you give from your life experience about who and what God is. When we are encouraged to keep the commandments of Jesus, that list I read out a bit ago in the children's message, what, what does it look like about your affirmations in life about God? We know God in shared community. We know God through suffering and uh, encouragement and times of challenge. In our Acts passage today, there is that powerful statement of faith that dates back six centuries and is part, I'm sure, of human experience from day one in God we live and move and have our being. How does that statement come to life anew in this community? I've been here um, nine months. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Uh, I started, we started this process together just about a year ago, which feels like it was a blink of the eye. Um, how we see that statement of living in God and moving and being in God as a community by showing our love for God and for one another as part of a, a vibrant, inspired group of people um, is the question. It's an invitation that's more about sharing our own experience through our actions than it is about getting people to say certain words um, or not acting in a certain way that's evolved from centuries of dogma and doctrinal language that may be familiar to some of us, but uh, not at all familiar and in fact are incomprehensible to recent generations who have not grown up in the church and yet still have an experience of the divine in the world. How do we say that experience is the God of Christ? and we are here to live life through that holy ground. So we can give our witness. We can share what a difference Christ has made in our lives, the way we live. We can show by our actions and yes, our own love that we have been transformed in some way. We offer Christ the best that we have, the best that we can with joy and hopefully genuine enthusiasm. And then we wait, for it's not our work to convert someone else's heart. That work is God's alone. Thanks be to God and to Christ that we have the gift of the paraclete, the spirit, the breath of God always among us to guide us in that process. To the God of our yesterdays and our todays and our tomorrows unto eternity be all honor and glory, now and forevermore. Amen.
Lord our God, we give you thanks that you are our God and we are your people. Generous God, we bring you these gifts because we know that our life and all human life rightfully belongs to you and that everything we have, we hold in trust from you. We praise you for everything you have done for us in Jesus Christ. Help us, therefore, to make our own offering complete by living in obedience to you through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we ask it. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> As we worship God this morning, let us bring our prayers from our spirits, our hearts, our minds before God in a time of peace and prayer. Let us pray. Father and mothering God, Jesus addressed you with the familiarity of a child to a loving parent and modeled that kind of trusting reliance on you, our creator so that we might have a role model for our prayers and relationships. We acknowledge you this morning as far greater than we can comprehend, as a way of truth and life, and yet still as our loving parent. Hear our prayers this day, O oh God, as we speak in the name of your Son, our brother and teacher and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Healing God, we uplift before you all those in need of your touch in body, mind, and spirit, in livelihood, in ways of being in the world, and we ask that your healing touch be instrumental in repairing relationships and in repairing bodies and spirits. Peace-loving God who forgives us our sins and who calls on us to be equally forgiving. We ask that you give your strength, your wisdom, your presence to the leaders of the world, the leaders of families, those in broken relationships, those in loving relationships. Infuse us all with your peace, your power of presence, and your depth of love. Wise creator, continue to educate us to the needs of this world that we only hold in trust for a short amount of time. Let us know the direction to bring your church that brings others to the gift of your presence in their lives, to the knowledge and the awareness that community and the gift of salvation is available and is a, a privilege in our society and in the world. Fairest, fairest judge, we ask your forgiveness for the times that we fall short of the mark, for all that we need to forgive also in the world, that by your example, in forgiving us, we may forgive ourselves and others. Generous spirit, we give thanks this day for days of respite, for safe travel, for healthy families, for all of the possibilities of life itself. Hear us as we have prayed our concerns and celebrations from our hearts and our minds this day and hear those that we hold only in our thoughts as we pray together, as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn again is an insert. They'll know we are Christians.
here is ended. Our service in the world continues. So go in peace. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.